Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to SFF 180, and a new episode in my series, Reading the Hugos, where, in case you couldn't tell, I've decided against going in strict chronological order for the awards, and I'm instead just jumping around throughout the years as I see fit. Today we're looking at 2010, a year that resulted in a rare best novel tie. One of those winners was The Wind-Up Girl, the highly anticipated debut novel by Paolo Bacigalupi. The book was an expansion of two novelettes, The Calorie Man and Yellow Card Man, which were both Hugo finalists themselves. The Wind-Up Girl depicts a grimy post-echo crash near future dystopia in which peak oil has long since peaked, and the most cherished source of energy is measured in the tightly regulated calories one consumes and burns every day. If you like world building, this novel's vision of a bleak and corrupt civilization in decline makes Blade Runner look like it was shot on plywood backdrops in someone's garage. It's so immersive that you can practically smell the environment and feel its tropical heat wafting from the pages. As a work of idea fiction, speculating on the direction humanity may take once we're done wrecking the planet and depleting our resources, the book is refreshingly not didactic, but coldly convincing. Emphasis on the coldly. Simply put, you don't want to live here. But it's a redemptive tale in its own way. The winners here are the ones who manage to survive with their integrity intact, while those quick to compromise what few ethics they have end up caught in the inexorable rush of events. The most sobering theme in the story has nothing to do with its cautionary portrayal of our possible post-fossil fuel future, but how most of the people living in it haven't learned the lessons of history. As their world proceeds to collapse around them, They'll fight amongst themselves over cash and power and ideology before coming together to solve problems every time. It takes place in late 22nd century Bangkok. The tropical environment feels like a metaphor for the human condition. Now, I lived in Southeast Asia as a boy, Singapore to be precise, and I can tell you it's beautiful, but the climate is stifling, heavy, way too hot, and for much of the year, everything feels like it's either about to melt down or blow away. Batrigalupi establishes an ensemble cast that he wisely keeps from getting too big and unwieldy. Anderson Lake is an American calorie man, shipped overseas to run a ramshackle factory, manufacturing electricity-generating springs. But it's a cover for his real work, the stealthy hunt for a hidden gene bank that has allowed the ties to create thriving new lines of fruit and other produce, immune to existing strains of engineered plagues. Hawk Seng is his Malay Chinese factory assistant in Thailand, only as a despised yellow card alien and dreaming of regaining his former life of wealth and prestige. The city itself is circled by levies and run by the trade ministry, all too eager to cut deals and take foreign bribes, and the Environment Ministry, White Shirts, who are all that stand between the city and any number of gene hack infections that can ravage the populace. Naturally, the two ministries are bitter enemies. The most notorious White Shirt enforcer, JD, known as the Tiger of Bangkok, does his job with a sense of incorruptible righteousness worthy of Elliot Ness. Though he's popular in the press, there is only so far trade is willing to let him go in driving away foreign dirigibles and burning imported goods by the pallet load. Now, JD's lieutenant, a humorless and efficient young woman named Kanya, actually has much going on below the surface, and in many ways, she will experience the most profound arc of all the story's characters. This is a story of people doing their best to survive where there are fewer and fewer niches in which to do so. And this brings us to the title character, Amiko, a Japanese-built new person, genetically engineered for subservience and pleasure, but with the will to know there's something better and the emotional capacity to wish for it. At first, her presence in the story is rather incongruous. She feels out of place in this seething tropical biopunk slum with her false innocent beauty and the 
herky-jerky body movements that earn her that nickname, but that's the point. She belongs nowhere, in a future where everyone is running out of places to belong. This is a world where Echo Terror has wrecked the crop yields of entire nations, and all the calorie companies care about is profit while holding the power to decide if millions enjoy feast or famine. Created by this very same gene tech, the wind-ups give people a scapegoat upon which to project their anger. Many readers are simply too disturbed and put off by the very presence of Amiko, which I would argue is the point. You are meant to be repelled by the amorality that creates beings like her in the first place, and then subjects her to a life of every kind of abuse, with her only dream of escape a rumored haven for wind-ups somewhere to the north that is almost certainly mythical. But it fits! that Emiko will be the catalyst for the story's most profound events. Though she does find herself in something of a relationship with Lake, she remains isolated in her view of the world, indifferent to the political cauldron boiling up in the city around her. At one point, she will do something motivated solely by a newfound sense of self-interest, because even an artificial new person has a line beyond which they can take no more. And this act will determine Bangkok's fate for good or ill. As you might have figured out by now, this is emphatically not a book for everyone. For many readers' tastes, the wind-up girl will feel much too oppressive. You have to work for this book's rewards, and it is a polarizing love-it-or-hate-it novel among SF fans at large. But once you're committed, Bacigalupi's storytelling is never less than electric, and his characters, human or wind-up, develop a real connection to the reader that keeps them from being overwhelmed by the obsessively detailed world. This was a debut more impressive to me in many ways than Neuromancer, and it made Paolo Bacigalupi a writer to watch. And there you have it! That's all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180. Now, I have simultaneously uploaded my review of the other winning novel for 2010, China Mieville's The City and the City, a very different novel from this one, but one that I consider brilliant in its own right. So go and check that out. Otherwise, you guys know the drill. These are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you have not done so, that is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon where recruits into Wink's army get little perks, like occasionally early access to some of my videos, depending on if I finish them in time. But I want to thank all of those wonderful people for their additional support, because I use the Patreon money to pay Matt Olson, my wonderfully gifted channel artist who does these amazing thumbnails and animations and stuff for me. So again, thank you all so much for that extra support. I want to thank all the rest of you for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube, and... Until I see all of you next time, please stay safe and healthy, and happy reading.